Well, welcome, Harvest. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here. My name is Alan Holman, and I've got a few announcements I'd like to go over with you this morning. If you are a new visitor who, and you have just checked in with us, we invite you to text us today and receive a special introduction about Harvest just by texting WELCOME to 559-245-6200. If you are a first-time visitor, please stop by the table in the entrance to pick up a gift we have for you. Also, if everyone would take a moment to fill out our friendship registers, you'll find those on the inside aisles. And again, fill those out. Let us know that you're here and if you have any prayer requests, and then just pass that along the aisle to the outside if you would, please. All right, men, we got a new study coming up this summer. It's going to be a six week. Uh, we're pretty excited about this. We're actually going to kick this off on July 8th. And again, uh, we're going to be using a, a, a bot. A book study this time. It's going to be Manhood Restored by Eric Mason. And again, that's going to be a six week study. Um, the crisis that exists within every man, again, we are only going to be delivered when Jesus returns. But again, Christ is the person that continues to point us back towards the gospel. And again, it's a vision of renewal through this study. Manhood Restored combines theological depth with practical insights, putting men in step with the gospel-centered manhood that will enrich every facet of your life. Again, men, we'll start Saturday mornings in the church office at 7.30 a.m. There'll be copies of this book available the morning of, and again, you can either RSVP, or if you have any questions regarding this, go ahead and send that to Carlos Guzman, if you would, please. All right, women, it's time for you. It is time to register for that Harvest Fresno Women's Retreat. It will be on August 4th through the 6th at Calvin Crest. We are again going to be blessed to have Elise Fitzpatrick as a speaker for that event. The cost for Harvest members as well as, well as the regular attenders is $200 per person for two nights and five meals. For anyone who doesn't attend Harvest, the cost will be $240. But again, there will be a special discount coupon code for our women via the weekly email to bring the price down to $200. If you are not on our current email list, again, we would encourage you to do that. There's a lot of information that comes out in our weekly email in addition to what I'm talking about this morning. And again, if you'd like to get added to our weekly email, please go to church at harvestfresno.org and we'll get you added to the list. All right, you guys, let's praise the Lord. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, all stand and get ready to sing some song. This is Harvest Acoustic. We are not... We don't have any of the fancy bells and whistles on, so I guess I just thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> this is where worship starts. Here in the temple of my heart, remembering who you are, all you've done. And this is your majesty, all I have tasted and I've seen, remembering who you are once again. All of 
of the kingdom in Christ you are you are the Lord seated upon the throne the God who is three in one the Father the Spirit the Son you are you are the
Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. A love so amazing, A love so amazing. Messiah, a name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners. Ransom from heaven, the Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body, the bread, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing yeah. Jesus Messiah name above all Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Pastor Michael is coming up from uh, campus to 
preach from the word this morning, and um, come on up. All right, well, good morning, everybody. If I have not met you yet, yes, my name is Michael. I'm over at Campus Bible Church. I have the privilege of working with our students over there. So I work with uh, junior high, high school, and college students, but it's always a privilege to come and hang out with you guys on a Sunday like this. So especially because, I mean, it's really close. That's convenient, too. That works out really well. We actually dropped our kids off over there for Sunday school, and then we get like a little 10-minute date as we drive over here, my wife and I. So it just all works out so well. Uh, Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles or got some kind of digital device you use, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. As you do that, just to let you know a little bit about me, um, I grew up, I was a pastor's kid. I guess I still am a pastor's kid. My dad is now retired, but you know, once a pastor's kid, always a pastor's kid. So I grew up in church and uh, being around church a lot, not only on Sundays, but just throughout the week, and then oftentimes just hanging out when my dad was in the office. I'd just be there. It was a very normal thing for me and my siblings. I'm the youngest of five kids. And we always liked being at church and doing things at church, but growing up, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for us to, like, serve in church. Uh, eventually, when I became a teenager in high school, I joined the worship team and things like that. But, but as a kid, I, I wanted things to do. I wanted ways to serve, but I didn't always have those opportunities. However, there was always one thing every year that came up that I knew I could be a part of. My friends would want to be a part of it. I'd want to be a part of it. That was the annual Christmas pageant we put on every year. We were always excited about this because, you know, you knew you could, first off, they never really said no to anyone who wanted to sign up. You know, they'd find a part. So maybe the first year you're going to be like a donkey or a rock or something. I don't know. You're going to have some kind of part. And then as you get more experience doing it, they'd usually move you into speaking roles and, and you get kind of more important ones maybe. And I think the year that I turned 11, maybe 12, I finally got the lead. I got the most important part in the Christmas play. I was going to be wise man number three. So I knew I made it. That was it. I was so excited. I think I was mostly excited because it was a speaking role, and I knew it was like a character that was actually in there. You know, with so many kids that wanted to be involved, again, you'd have like the wise men, you'd have shepherds, Mary and Joseph. But then it was always my friend's mom who put it on, and she would kind of get creative and like add characters because kids wanted to be in it. She's like, and then Joseph's cousin, Bill, will be in it as well. And it's like, these characters that didn't really exist in the Bible necessarily, but they might have existed back then. But this was one that was actually there. Wise man number three, that was me. I was going to be in the play and actually have an important role. And this was about 25 years ago. And I still remember my opening line 25 years later. It went like this. If the first integer equals the second integer... And if the second integer equals the third integer, then the first integer must equal the third integer. I still remember. I didn't even have to think about it. Like, as I was writing this message, it just popped in my head. I knew this line. And some people might say, well, wow, like, that's a really good memory. No, I don't don't think that's it. I don't think it's just a good memory. Because if I had a, a great memory, then why throughout college could I never remember the next morning what I studied the night before? Why can I not remember what I had for dinner two days ago? I don't know. Why can I not remember if even just the handful of times I've been here, have I already told this story? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't think it was a memory issue. What I think it is, is looking at that line, I think it was just a really amazing line. Because it's such a strange, even as I was speaking it and I was like learning these lines, I was like, oh, I didn't know we were going to be doing this in a different language. That's like, that'll be fun. That'll be interesting. I didn't know what most of that meant. So actually, I looked it up. First off, we're going to get a little quick lesson here. Integer. An integer is a whole number. So if you didn't know that, you're welcome. A whole number. So basically what this was saying, this line essentially meant if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. It's some kind of math principle that I vaguely remember. But as I was doing this deep dive on this subject of integer, I found out that it's actually from the Latin word integer. And that means something that is whole or intact, or, or literally speaking of something that's, that's undivided. So like, I like to think of things in terms of food, so I'm picturing like a pie. You know, if you have a pie and it's whole and untacked, it, it's not divided. No one's taken a slice out of it yet. That's what that means. And this is actually where we get our root word for integrity. The English word integrity, what that means, it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Or another definition, when I Googled this, that popped up, was the state of being whole and undivided. 
something that is untouched, something that's whole, something that's intact. Whenever I'm preparing a message, of course, the first thing I start with is I, I spend time looking at the text, praying over it. But as I do that, I, I want to find one main idea, one main thing. Maybe it's because I primarily work with students, and I know that they're probably not going to listen to most of what I say, but if they can just get one thing, maybe they can walk away with that. So as I was looking at this text in Matthew 6, I was thinking, what's the one thing? What's the one thing that I can look at and say, okay, this is what I think God's trying to say through this? And as I was working on that, this is what I started with. I started with the idea that I think what it's saying is that God calls us to live undivided lives. I was pretty happy with that. I said, yeah, that seems good. So I kind of stepped back from my computer, and I was looking at it, thinking, like, okay, I think this is what it is. And then pretty quickly, I I scrapped it, because I don't think that's actually what's being said here. Because when you think about it, our lives are actually very divided. Our lives have a lot of division to them. There, there's work, there's home, there's, there's weekdays, there's weekends, there's good days, there's bad days. Our lives are full of, of segments, of compartments. But who we are through each of those different segments, each of those different compartments, that needs to be the same. We need to be the same individual. So if I have a bad day, I'm still me. If I have a good day, I'm still me. So instead, what I think God is saying, and what we need to get from this text, is that, that God calls us to be undivided people. Each of us are going to go through lives and, and have a lot of compartments and segments to those lives. But through them all, God calls us to be undivided people. We need to be people of integrity, people that are whole and undivided. Every day. To paraphrase wise man number three, we need to be that whole undivided integer, that thing that is the same, that is the same, that is the same in every situation of life. Now, I believe to be undivided people, the first thing we're going to look at, we have to have an undivided focus. If you have your Bibles, look down to Matthew 6, verse 22. There it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Have you ever been having a conversation with someone, you're talking to them, and as you're talking, you can kind of tell they're, they're not really paying attention. And maybe it's as you're talking, you kind of just see them start to just look around, or maybe they're looking right at you, but you can kind of just tell their eyes start to glaze over, or they just kind of start yawning as you're talking. Whatever it is, you can tell they're not totally focused. They're not locked in. We need to be people of focus. It's so important that we have focus and focus on the right thing. It's important that we keep our eyes on the right thing. In the Old Testament, when it spoke of the eye, it was talking of like the direction of a person's life. So it would say basically that if you had like an evil eye, well, that means you're, you're focused on the things of the world. If you had a pure eye, it means you were focused on the things of God. So for us, we need an undivided focus. The first point I want to bring up is that our focus affects our direction. This is why focus matters, because it affects where we're going to go. Just like we use our physical eyes to to navigate the physical world, well, we use our spiritual eyes to navigate the spiritual one. We need to understand where we're going, what we're doing, and our focus is what affects where we go. Now, remember that Jesus went head-to-head time and time again with the Pharisees. And and why did he do this? Because technically speaking, if you were back in the time of Christ and, and you saw Jesus challenging the Pharisees, saying basically, do not be like them. It would be confusing because at that time, they were the peak, the epitome of spirituality. They did everything right. So Jesus didn't necessarily just challenge their actions. He challenged where their focus was. They were focused on man's praise. They were focused on man's recognition. They were focused on themselves, not on God. So yes, they they did the right things. They did all the right things, But because of the wrong focus, Jesus says they are going a wrong direction. A couple of girls I knew, when they were in high school, uh, they were driving together. And at this time, thank goodness, there wasn't distractions like smartphones. So they weren't really messing with a phone, but there was other things to distract us. They were driving, and one girl just went to turn the knob on the radio, just change the channel to something different. Commercial popped up, change the channel. And when she looked back up from the radio to the road, she saw that she was no longer on the road. They crashed into the guardrail of the highway. Luckily, they were both okay. The car, not so much. But they were all right. And talking to them afterwards, she said, I only took my eyes off the road for a second. 
That's all it took. All it took was one second of just focusing on the wrong thing to get off track, to get off the road that she was supposed to be on. Growing up in the church, I had a lot of friends that I grew up with, but, but as we got older, I started to see that they started to not follow Christ. And this is part of why I got into student ministry. I thought it was confusing to see them go to a place where we grew up in similar homes. We grew up going to the same school. We grew up going to the same youth group, the same church, and yet we went different directions. Why? What happened? And I think there's lots of reasons that this happens, but, but I think a lot, one of the things it comes down to is focus. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth to wander off into myths. So maybe they, they start off focused on the right thing. But what we have to understand is that, that a good start does not guarantee you're going to finish well. Starting from a good place doesn't mean you're going to end up where you're supposed to end up. So they start off in the right thing, focusing on the right thing, but eventually something new, something shiny comes along, and their focus drifts. Now their attention's on something else. Now they have a choice. Okay, do I focus on the truth, or do I focus on my own desires, on my own passions, on the things that I just want to do? And when faced with a choice, what happens oftentimes is they focus on the wrong thing, which then affects their direction and that's how they get off the path. So to be undivided people, we need undivided focus. But what else we need? We also need to move forward in an undivided direction. Look at verse 23. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So, so think of a bad eye as something like uh, being spiritually, visually impaired being not able to see clearly. If someone has their, their spiritual eyes focused on the wrong thing, that's going to affect a lot of their life. They won't see things clearly. Now, whereas we talked about things that can happen in, a, in an instant, I think this will happen slowly over time. I think this can happen very imperceptibly. Now, I don't want to come up here and start bragging, but I'm going to do it for a second. Uh, growing up, I had better than perfect vision. I didn't even know that was possible, but sure enough. So, so 20-20 vision is where you can like see at 20 feet what you should be able to see at 20 feet. I went to the eye doctor, and they looked at it, and they're like, oh, wow, this is, this, you actually have 20-19, which means I could see at 20 feet what someone would have to see at 19 feet, a foot closer. And I remember sitting there in the eye doctor's office and just kind of like thinking about this and taking it in and realizing this is what it feels like to know you have a superpower. This is, this is my moment. I don't know what kind of superhero that would be, but I guess I could see crime happen a foot further away than the average person. You know, I could notify police a little bit faster maybe. I don't know what I was going to do with this, but I knew I needed to do something. And I kind of got this place of like, man, like, not only do I have perfect vision, but better than perfect. Most people would say perfect is as, as good as it can get. No, no, no. Better than perfect. So, of course, why would I go to the eye doctor for a yearly exam? Like, what are they going to tell me, that I'm more perfect? Ah, no, that's fine. So I stopped going to the eye doctor. Now, eventually, I had to go for some reason. I can't remember it was a, a thing for my license or something. I needed to go get checked up again. I was 18 or 19 years old. So I went, and I was okay, I'll do this whole process. We'll sit there. And it was a new eye doctor, so I was kind of waiting for that moment when they realized how amazing my eyesight is. So I'm sitting there, and the doctor's doing something. He's writing something down, and he hands me this piece of paper. And he says, here's your prescription for glasses. I kind of thought, like, okay, this must be a joke, right? Because clearly... He went to one of those eye doctor conventions and heard about me, and he's just trying to be funny or something. That's probably what happened. And so I'm like, no, 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 I have, I, have, I have better than perfect vision. And he's like, you might have before, but you don't anymore. I can't remember what the prescription was, but it was not 2019. It was not 2020 even. It had gotten worse. So I had to leave and eventually come back and pick up the glasses. And, and here, keep in mind, I drove to pick up my glasses. And when I was leaving the doctor's office, as I was driving out, I was amazed at how just clear everything was. Like even the stoplight right around the corner, instead of like a kind of a fuzzy blurry thing, it was like a sharp red circle. So by the way, if you see a fuzzy blurry thing, you should go to the eye doctor because it's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be sharp and focused. And even that night, I still remember looking up at the moon and being like, oh yeah, the moon has craters on it. I'd forgotten. It had been so long since I'd clearly seen it that I just kind of forgot. Now what had happened 
was over time, things had gotten out of focus. And I think that's the danger for any of us. It could be a moment where we focus on the wrong thing. That can be devastating. But I think what can happen is just a little bit over time. Gradually, things get a little less sharp, a little less clear, a little out of focus. Because we're not looking through the right lens. To see everything clearly, to see things as they truly are, we have to look through the lens, the corrective lens of Jesus Christ. And if we look through that, then we'll see things as they really are. We'll perceive things accurately. It will affect our entire lives. I mean, think about it. If you haven't been to the eye doctor for a while, maybe you'll remember this, or maybe you went recently. But when you go in, they put those funny glasses on you, and you know, they put different things in there, and you kind of sit there and look at this thing, and it's always an E first, so you know you're going to get that one right. But then they go and they say, okay, which one's better? Is it one or two? And you're like, it looks the same. One or two? And they keep going, one or two. And you had to pick one, okay, I guess two. Okay, now is it three or four? Three or four? And they do this for a while, and they all kind of look equally out of focus until all of a sudden, shh, everything becomes clear. And you're like, oh, that's the one. Lots of so-called prescriptions that could be wrong for you, but only one that is actually right. Once again, the same is true in our spiritual lives. There's only one thing that will make everything be clear. Second point is that there's only one way to the light, but many paths to darkness. Jesus is the only way. And if we have our spiritual eyes fixed, if we're looking through him, we'll see things clearly. We'll see things the way they really are. Then we can actually know that we're moving in the right direction. We're going where we're supposed to be going. Lots of different ways we could go that are wrong. Only one way we can go that's actually right. If your eyes are physically blurry, it's hard to like move forward with confidence. Sometimes, still to this day, I wear contacts now. And sometimes in the morning, I'll forget to put contacts on. And around my house, everything's familiar. I know where things are. I can easily navigate. I don't really think about it. But when I go to my car and get in that and pull out into the street and I look around, I'm like, oh, I forgot again. I have to go back because I've been in my familiar little bubble, but now when I get outside of that, then it's easier to recognize things aren't as clear as I thought. If we go through our day-to-day motions, it's easy to not realize that maybe we're losing focus, that maybe things aren't as clear as we thought they were. If our eyes are blurry physically, it's hard to move forward. If our eyes are blurry spiritually, it's hard to move forward in our spiritual walk. One thing I tell my students over and over again is that you got to keep moving forward in your faith. None of us arrive at enough Jesus. None of us get to a place where, like, I have reached the top level of discipleship. I'm the executive gold level. I'm good enough. That's it. No. We all need to constantly be moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. But we got to be sure we're moving forward in the right direction. Otherwise, we're going to get off path. We're going to get in trouble. Now, I also want to stress that it doesn't mean we can't pursue other things as we pursue Christ, of course. Do we need to pursue and focus on things like jobs and relationships and friends and school and all these different stuff? Of course. All those things are important, but how do we focus on those things? It needs to be through the lens of Jesus. So we pursue those things as we pursue Christ, not instead of pursuing Christ. Working with students, I think one of the things I most often get asked about is dating. Students want to know about dating. I always tell them the same thing, don't date. I actually usually say the opposite. My wife and I met in youth groups, so I'm always like, go to youth group. Trust me, it'll work out. It's a good place to be. But no, I do tell them, well, here's the thing. The important thing is how do you pursue someone? It needs to be in a God-honoring way. And so you pursue someone, whatever it might be, anything in life that we pursue, we can pursue that thing as long as we're also pursuing Christ. And as long as that is the highest pursuit, other things can fall in order under that. But we can never deviate from pursuing Christ first and foremost as the chief thing. As long as we're moving towards him, we'll be fine. There's no detour then. We don't get off just for a little bit to pursue something else and come back to pursuing Christ. We stay on that path. Jesus has to be our highest aim. He has to be our, our, our highest goal. He has to be our highest pursuit. And then everything else just falls in line behind there. As followers of Jesus, he calls us to be devoted to him. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, in that verse, it tells us again the importance of focus. It says you got to move forward in your faith. 
you got to run this race marked out for you. But, but how do you do that? You do it by focusing on Jesus. And even Jesus, when he went to the cross, how did he endure that? He did it by focusing on the joy set before him. We have to have focus. But we got to be focused on the right thing. My wife and I, we have three children, and now they're, they're 10, 7, and 5. But, but, of course, each of them at one point had to learn how to walk. And I think about that process with each of them. It'd be my wife, Megan, on one side, kind of holding the baby, and me across the living room, and, and she'd hold the baby up. And for a second, they kind of stand there, and then as Megan would move her hands away, they are standing on their own. And on the other side, I'm calling to them, and all of a sudden, they look at me, they lock in, and they kind of take a step forward, and then take a step forward. They're walking. Of course, Megan and I, then we start celebrating, and as soon as they hear mom's voice again, they look back, and then boom, down they go. Luckily, they have the diaper. It's extra padding. It's okay. But that was always a process with each one. If they were focused forward, they would be moving forward. As soon as their focus shifts behind them, they couldn't stay standing. They went down. Sometimes we forget that our focus needs to be in front of us. It needs to be in Jesus who goes before us. We need to keep our eyes fixed forward and be moving forward. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. We are called to walk in the light. And there's only one way to do that. Of course, we all know that we need to be born again. We need to be saved. But, but we're not just called to become spiritual infants. We are born again in Jesus Christ, but then we need to grow up in him, learn more about him, pursue him every single day. We are to walk in the light as he is in the light. By following Jesus forward, we move forward. To be undivided people, what we also need, we need to have undivided loyalty. Look at verse 24. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. I don't think I can say any more simple than this. Our, our third point is that Jesus wants our undivided loyalty. Simple as that. If we say we follow him, then we actually need to follow him. I mean, it's very easy to say I'm a follower of Jesus, but, but in my daily lives, my actions, am I actually following? Am I actually pursuing him? We actually need to do those things. It says there we have to serve him. We can't pick two masters. No, we pick one, and we serve that one. Serve, it's the Greek word douleo. It speaks of the work of, of what's called a doulos. A doulos was essentially just a slave. A doulos was a bondservant was not an employee. Sometimes we think about this in the, in the relation to how we have things today. There's a boss you might have and you as an employee, and, and we kind of frame our relationship with Jesus like that. But the problem is we, we don't get a clock in and out of being a follower of Jesus. It's not something that we just do eight hours a day and that's it. It's not something that we do 12 hours a day. No, 24 hours a day we are a doulos. We are a servant of Jesus Christ. Now think about it this way too. A, a servant, a slave, was not shared by multiple masters. It was wholly owned by, by one. Right when I got out of high school, I, started, I got a job doing maintenance at a school. And so this job, it went from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Started really early, but it was nice because it also then got out early. So I remember getting off about 2 o'clock and thinking, like, I have the whole day still. Friends are in school, they're there working. Like, what am I going to do with myself? Now, at the same time, my wife, Megan, was living overseas in Germany. We were dating and I wanted to go visit her, but that was expensive. And since she was in Europe, I thought, well, I'd also like to travel around and see Europe, but that was expensive. And I also thought, well, since I really like her, I, I should propose to her to get married, but you got to have a ring, and those also are expensive. So I had a, a, a deficit of money, but I had plenty of time. So I decided I'd get another job. So I had the 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. job at the school doing maintenance, and then 3 to 11, I'd work at a pizza place. And then I started also interning at a church. So I did those things and started saving up the money so that I could, in fact, then have enough to spend on these things. But the interesting thing was, each of these three different jobs, each looked at me as primarily having that job. Like, that was my thing. The other things were just kind of extra. I remember the, the boss I had at the pizza place, he even told me one time, like, okay, this is your real job. Like, that thing you're doing at the church, like, that's your, your moonlighting there. This is your real one, so you got to prioritize this. Each of them wanted me to do that. And at first what happened, it, it worked out. I could juggle it. It was fine. But eventually, these things came into conflict. Eventually, one job might want me to stay later, but I had to go to the next one. Or maybe that one wanted me to come in earlier. Or maybe the, it's the same day that I worked at him. More and more conflict started happening. 
So eventually I had to choose which one to keep. That's bound to happen. Now the same is true in our lives. What is our highest loyalty? What's our highest master? Having different bosses, they might not like the idea that I have different jobs, but they don't really have a say in it. A master and a slave relationship, that's totally different. The master says, no, you are completely and totally mine. If we try to serve two masters for a while, the the truth is it can work for a while. For a little while, we can serve two different masters, and we can look at that and say, well, actually, it's working out just fine. It's not that big of a deal. But there will come a point where there will be conflict, and at that point, we'll have to choose. And whatever our highest priority is is the one we'll choose. If earning income is the highest priority, well, then sometimes we'll say, sorry, Jesus, I'm going to go do this. If popularity, if pride, if any of these things are are a higher priority, when it comes down to that choice, we'll choose something over Jesus. That's why he says you can't serve two masters. In America, we call this, this concept is like the American dream, right? It's especially hard for us because we have this concept of like, well, I want it all. And there's nothing wrong with that unless it becomes the most important thing. We find this concept of of being a slave to Jesus, a voluntary servant, kind of hard because we like the fact. I mean, two days, we're going to celebrate our freedom. Side note, John Adams thought July 2nd would be the date we'd always celebrate, but that's a different story. It's when they actually voted to declare independence. The fourth is when they had the article written up. There you go. Here's your little trivia fact for the day. But we have this thing where we say, no, we are free. We want to be free. That's a good thing. Our freedom in this country is a tremendous blessing. But here's the thing. If you're a citizen of heaven, you're not actually free. Because then we're just slaves to Jesus. Yes, we're also sons and daughters. We're also friends. But really what it comes down to, he is our master. And when we say things like that, people find it offensive because we think of like American slavery, which was horrible and repressive and this awful thing. And, And Roman slavery was no joy, but it was different. In Roman system of slavery, slaves would actually work for an income. Usually it started out as like an indentured servitude. You had a debt you couldn't pay, you wanted to buy some land, or you owed money on the land, so you'd say, okay, I will work for you X amount of years to pay this debt off. Deal. And what could often happen then is they could earn freedom, but then often they would get to a place where they would say, well, this actually works out pretty well. I I have a family now. I actually enjoy the job that I have. And and once I am paid off, I still want to continue working at this, so they would continue in that, sometimes even taking on the family name. That's not the oppressive slavery that we often think of. In fact, Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, Jude, John, all of them refer to themselves as bondservants, as a doulos, as a slave of Jesus. And they do this proudly. In the first century, when you write a letter, your opening statements, you put your credentials out there. You say, this is the thing about me. This is why you should listen to me. This is why you should pay attention to what I'm saying. And they start off by saying, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. That was the most important thing about them. So so having a master, it's not like it's a choice. We just have to choose who our master is. And and spoiler alert, it's not you. It's either going to be the world or it's going to be Jesus Christ. We have two choices. Now, some people say, well, I don't want that. I don't don't want to serve Jesus. I, I want to be free. I just want to do whatever I want. That's just choosing a different kind of slavery. Jesus is a better master because he offers us freedom from sin. He offers us an inheritance. He offers us to be his children, to be his friend. But we still have to understand it doesn't mean we're totally free. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Did you catch that? You are not your own. We often use that verse when we're talking about things like purity, which is an important part of that as well. But what it's actually saying is that, yes, you are free from sin in Jesus Christ, but that does not mean you are free to do whatever you want. You were bought with a price. You are owned by Jesus. And he says, look, I did this for you, but I also have plans for you. I now want your undivided loyalty, all of you. And I think if we look at that and we work through that text, we can see that it makes sense But if you're like me, maybe you get to the end of that verse where he says, you cannot serve God in wealth. And that seems kind of strange. Because he just made a big deal saying you can't serve two masters. You really drove that home. Okay, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. Yeah, I understand. So why does he point out this one scenario where he's like, oh, and by the way, you can't serve God in wealth? Well, yeah. 
That makes sense. I mean, I, I get it. I can't serve God in pride. I can't serve God in dishonesty. I can't serve God in selfishness. I can't serve two masters. The word wealth there, it, it's sometimes translated as money, maybe in your translation that you have. It's actually an Aramaic word, mamona, which, which just literally speaks of like wealth or property in, in a literal translation, but, but in a wider sense, what it spoke of was just like the good life, having it all. Again, what we would call the American dream. And again, I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with that unless we desire that more than anything else. Unless comfort, security is the thing that we say, I'll do anything, even if it means not following Jesus. Because let's be honest, sometimes following Jesus is not the most advantageous thing to do. Sometimes it won't be the best thing in the workplace. Sometimes it won't be the best thing with relationships. Sometimes following Jesus could cost us. And so in those moments, what is going to be the most important thing? Yes, we can seek the good life while we also seek Jesus, but what happens when those two things come in conflict? When it becomes the good life or Jesus? In those moments, what are we going to do? I'll give you a personal example. From a very early age, uh, I felt called to be in ministry. I thought that's what God wanted. And I I also believe Scripture is very clear that all of us are in ministry. Every single one of us. We've all been gifted and wired and, and designed in unique ways for God to use in His kingdom in different ways. So when I say ministry, I mean like vocational ministry, what I'm doing today. I feel like that's where God wanted me to be. But I chose, no, I didn't want to do that. And my reasoning was, I grew up in a pastor's family, and I thought, well, I don't want that because I want to be rich. I don't want to like not make enough, right? So I want to do something other than ministry. So I looked at other options. The way I looked at it, I thought God was like giving me advice. Like, hey, you know, here's something interesting you might want to consider. And I'm like, no, thanks, God. I'll take it under advisement, but I got my own ideas. And that was so wrong. Eventually, God course-corrected me over several years and and brought me to the place that I'm at, which I'm very happy about. But I looked at him wrong. I looked at him as an advisor, but that's not what the Bible says. An advisor offers advice. A master gives commands. And it's very clear that God is a master. At our our end, it's not a negotiation. It's, It's all or nothing. We don't, like, come to the table as equals and say, okay, well, here's my terms. And, like, you slide the paper across the table. God looks at it and is like, write something, slides it across to you. It doesn't work that way. It's not what it says. It says, he's the master, we're the servant. He says, I want your undivided loyalty. No terms. That's it. When there's a war, often the way a war will end is when one side surrenders. Make sense? But what will often happen is they'll offer terms of surrender. They'll offer papers. They'll say, okay, we'll, we'll lay down our weapons, but here's what we want to be guaranteed. We want these borders restored. We want your troops out of this city. We'll surrender, but we want it under these terms. Now, there's also a term within warfare called unconditional surrender. This is a surrender in which no guarantees are given to the surrendering party. So in the Civil War, the North demanded this from the South. In World War II, the Allies demanded this from, from Germany, Japan, in Italy, they said, we are giving you no terms. You just surrender. And they say, well, we want it. No, surrender. Surrender or we'll keep fighting. And usually it's when one side is, has the advantage over the other side. And this is what Jesus calls us to. Unconditional surrender. Total obedience. We don't come to Jesus and say, okay, okay. I'll surrender if. There's no if. We come to Jesus and we say, I surrender. To be undivided people, he, he wants all of us. And just think about that. He will not settle for part of you. He wants all of you because he loves all of you, because he died for all of you, because he paid for all of you. So he calls you to follow, all of you to follow, not just part, not just on Sunday morning, not just at the end of the day. Every hour of every day, he says, follow. In every area of our lives, he says, follow. He wants all of us. He wants us to be whole and undivided. He's called us to a better way of life. He's called us to something different. He's called us to stand out so that there's actual change and actual difference in the way that we live. Jesus stood out. He lived a different life. It cost him everything. So he says, I'm not going to make any terms. Even if I lead you to a hill with a thousand crosses, I want you to follow me with no questions, no terms. He says, I want your unconditional surrender. That's what we are called to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for each of us we would revisit uh, what it looks like for us to follow. That we wouldn't compartmentalize you to just part of our lives. 
that we wouldn't say this, here's a corner that you get, but that instead we'd understand you get it all. And within those lives, we have different areas, different things, different pursuits, different relationships. All that's okay as long as we give it all to you. As long as we follow you more than we follow ourselves. As long as we follow you, and in so doing, we come. We put to death our desires. We pick up our cross, and we follow you, whatever that looks like each day. So I pray for strength. I pray for clarity. I pray for wisdom so that we could see how do we do that, not just sitting here on a Sunday morning, but in our lives, how do we continue to follow you in a way that actually means something? If we're going to call ourselves your followers, help us to truly follow. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. The splendor of the King, the clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Thank you, Pastor Michael from campus, for coming today and preaching. And okay. Everyone have an incredible week and know that you are loved.